so this is really interesting because I realized that when we did a survey among our members, some of you reported back that that running an association in uh, during this pandemic situation is quite it's always challenging in a way to run a Huntington Association, but it's particularly challenging uh, now. Uh, and I think it's really good that we can come together here now and discuss how some have solved those challenges or are dealing with them in the best way they can. And if we can exchange some thoughts and experiences and, and ideas together, that would be really, uh, really good. So I think then I will just pass the word over to Kath who is the CEO of the Huntington's Disease Association for England and Wales. Please, Kat. Hi, everybody. Lovely to be here. Um, and so, yes, our organisation began in 1971, um, and it began when a lady was given a diagnosis of Huntington's in her family and was told that she was one of a handful of people in the UK affected by Huntington's disease. She actually put an advert in the local paper um, for a meeting for people to, if anyone else had Huntington's in their family. And there were about 12 people turned up to that meeting. And that was the origins of our association back in 1971. And um, since then, we've kind of grown uh, tremendously. So we do employ staff. I'm, I'm an employed member of staff. I don't have a family history of Huntington's disease. Um, however, I came to Huntington's because my background is actually in cancer care. So I worked in um, a Marie Curie hospice in Liverpool and as a ward sister there and at that time we took some non-cancer patients so we had two um, young adults who had juvenile Huntington's who used to come to us for respite and for me the, the kind of pull to work with Huntington's was that there was such a huge disparity about services that we could get for those two young people when we sent them back out into the community compared to if we had young cancer patients and I felt that that was really unfair so I um, saw a job advertised with the HDA and that's over 20 years ago now and uh, and things have grown since then so that's kind of a little bit of my background so what we're going to do today is Ruth and I are going to do a bit of a double act um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our charity kind of before Covid if any of us can remember that far away um, and then I'm going to tell you some of the kind of initial challenges that we had during COVID. And then I'm going to hand you over to Ruth, who's going to tell you about how we've managed to support our families and um, professionals and everybody involved with Huntington's during this tricky time. So that's kind of how we're going to do it. So if we could have the next slide, Ruth, please. So basically we're a medium sized charity and our kind of board of trustees, our executive council are our governing body. And we have a membership of over 6,000 families and that's a mixture of families and professionals. And at this moment in time, we're working with over 4,000 people with a diagnosis with Huntington's disease, as well as their families, friends and carers. I should say, if anybody's got any questions or they want to kind of ask me anything as I'm going along, um, I love interaction and I love people jumping in so don't please don't feel free feel, feel please feel free to ask so this is just a bit of a structure of our charity as i said before we're managed by our executive council um, operational responsibility of the charity is passed down to me we are kind of current income well our current income before covid shall we say was about 1.7 million um, and we then have our management team who are the let me know that and then we have various staff members that so we have um, a, a comms manager. We have our ops based staff who, are, uh, uh, the, who deal with the day to day stuff from our central office. We have a team of special advisors who remit really is to support families wherever they may be. So whether that's in their own homes, in nursing homes, in prisons, wherever, um, and also to provide education and training to professionals, as you are all very aware. The, the kind of awareness and understanding of Huntington's is, is quite uh, sparse in some areas. And then each of those departments have kind of other responsibilities. So we have a nursing home accreditation scheme, which is a fairly new project where um, nursing homes can apply to us to become accredited and they have to pass a series of standards and then they get a kite mark really to say that they have reached a certain standard. 
obviously data protection, safeguarding. And then we have in terms of um, people, families affected by Huntington's disease, we have a, a network of branches and support groups who are family members who, who are there for peer support for each other. We have um, a patient involvement group who input into all of our work and also help us when researchers and people come and ask for kind of a patient's voice and research and then various other service development projects. So that's kind of the structure of our charity. Next slide, Ruth. So we have kind of six main goals and any work that we do falls into these six goals. So improved quality care and support, better knowledge and understanding of Huntington's, greater opportunity for peer support and community involvement, improved understanding of Huntington's and uh, and of our work with, with the general public. That's one of the things that our families say to us frequently that they're frustrated that general public really don't know anything about Huntington's disease. We work very hard to try and raise that profile. Um, stronger charity to champion better needs of our community and supporting Huntington's research. So we do fund some Huntington's research, but we also work very closely with researchers who are working in the field of Huntington's both to be able to inform families what's happening, but also where people are um, people are recruiting to research projects and things like that. Next slide, Ruth. So during COVID, um, so we have um, a central office where our operations team and fundraising team is set up to work what have worked from, um, with no real resources for them to work from home. So in about a 48 period of hours of time, we had to really make sure that all of those people could work from home and that there was no interruption to service to families. That was really important to us. So we're, our office is actually within a shared office. So things like redirecting phones and things were not straightforward at all. But what we wanted to do was if somebody in distress was phoning the, our central line, that they still got the same service that they would if we were all based within the office. Um, so we had to redirect all the phones and then there were issues of cyber security. So I don't know whether this is unique to the UK, but one of the things that we saw quite early on were um, people kind of trying to abuse the fact that they realised that, that charities in particular will be moving people working from home and really targeting for fraud and things. So we had to make sure that um, whilst people were working from home, obviously people's information and details were kept very safe and then just simple things like collecting the post and um, all of our or we get a lot of kind of checks and things come in to the shared building and how we were going to bank that how we were going to kind of send mail out how we were going to make sure we get lots of a lot of our advisors work very closely with clinics we get clinic letters in that need to go out to the advisors so that they actually can provide support to those family members so just those very simple, basic things that you don't think about on a day to day basis. We really had to think we had about 48 hours between um, as it becoming apparent that lockdown was going to happen and it actually happening. So a lot of work went on from from the kind of management team and our operations team. Um, so the other thing that was really important to us that was that we really got a sense from our families and the people that we were working with. Um, of the impact of COVID on them. It became apparent very early on during lockdown that carers in particular were really struggling um, because the, the people that they were caring from with Huntington's disease were really were, couldn't really understand the lockdown rules. So um, we, we kind of very quickly got a survey out to families to see what problems that they were having um, any solutions that we could then draw from that and we'll talk about that a bit more later on also to our branches and support groups obviously they couldn't meet anymore during lockdown and still can't actually and so you know how could we best support them to carry on supporting the people that they normally would support in it and what did they need to be able to do that um, and again with professionals the same sort of thing so all um, I don't know what happens in other countries but within certainly within England and Wales all clinics all clinics stopped so people couldn't kind of access the, the multidisciplinary teams that they would normally have access to. So really working with the professionals to see how we could best support them in making sure that people could get some level of care during this time. 
And then again, our um, patient voice grief, which is important, really important to see again from their perspective as people, you know, family members, how best could we support those? Um, and then financial considerations. Um, so literally overnight, as an organisation, we are incredibly fortunate in that a lot of our income comes from individuals doing individual events. Our Huntington's community, our families are just incredibly supportive of our work. And so they do kind of all sorts of mad and crazy things and basic things like making cakes and all sorts of things like that. Obviously, from lockdown, all of that stopped literally overnight, which meant we lost a considerable amount of income overnight. But the other thing that was a real concern and still remains a real concern is obviously with an economic downturn within the country, our other funding comes from trusts and foundations. And most of those are trusts and foundations who are set up with a lump sum of money. And actually what is paid out is the dividends on those, um, on shares and things like that. And so if there's an economic downturn, clearly that has an effect on those. So we were losing kind of community income, but a real concern about um, how much trust and foundation income we would lose as well. Um, and then the, the UK government came up with a scheme where you could furlough staff. So obviously our staff were not able to go out and do visits in the community, go to clinics, do kind of face-to-face -face training sessions, in-person training sessions. And so although there was a lot of work still for us to do, um, in terms of travel and things, some of our um, advisors cover massive counties. Um, actually, the the kind of the, that sort of thing reduced. So we were able to furlough some staff across the whole of the organisation. So some man, one of the management team, one of the fundraising team, um, one of the operations team, and some of our specialist advisors, and get some income to be paying their wages while they weren't working which um, we still do have some staff on furlough as well. That comes to an end at the end of this month. Um, next slide, Ruth. So I think the other thing that was a real challenge for us was the rapidly changing information. So the information being put out from the government was literally changing. I said here hour by hour, but at times it was like literally minute by minute. So we were having to create bespoke information for our website and constantly change that web page. And um, one of the biggest impacts was the UK government put in something called shielding. So people who are considered to be extremely vulnerable were asked to stay at home and not go out for three months and not go shopping or um, attend medical appointments or anything at all. Um, this was done very quickly. And so it was really um, what happened was that it was done by diagnosis so there were certain diagnoses of across the board so it wasn't just Huntington's disease but people with certain cancers and things who were identified as high risk and they all received letters from both the government and from our department of health now obviously with Huntington's disease that's a bit of a different picture because you people late stage of Huntington's disease who have may have problems with kind of swallowing um chest infections and things clearly are a greater risk but those people in the earlier stages really weren't but everybody got the same letter so that created a very interesting um couple of days for us really allaying people's fears and anxieties where it wasn't necessary and working with statutory authorities to kind of say actually no you know this person is fine and, and I completely understand how that happened. You know, they were trying to kind of protect our most vulnerable people um, and had to do it in the easiest way and fastest way possible. But it created a massive amount of work and, and uncertainty and, and upset to our families. So that created um, a lot of work. And then we very early on adapted to use. So it was very clear that people needed different kinds of information. So we were getting lots of calls from carers saying that their person with Huntington's was, was maybe aggressive or irritable because they had to stay in and didn't understand kind of social distance and didn't understand that the cafe that they went to every day was closed. And so we were kind of becoming quite irritated. And so we, we quickly, and Ruth will talk a bit more about this, um, identified some key areas where we could put webinars on, which would give just very practical information about how those carers could cope with those situations um, and how best 
they could kind of support that individual and how they could kind of protect themselves as well. Um, next slide, Ruth. The other thing is our board of trustees. Um, so our board of trustees normally meet quarterly, but it became apparent with a very quickly changing situation that they needed to meet more regularly. So they met that and continue to meet on a monthly basis, really just to keep an eye on the situation, make sure we're doing everything we can and supporting people in the best way that we can. And our finance committee meeting again, they used to meet quarterly, but again, meeting monthly just to make sure that you know, we're on top of knowing where we are financially given uh, what is a drastic reduction in our income. But I think the other thing that became really important was that open and transparency with our staff. Um, so we had some staff who were in work, we had some staff who were on furlough, so they weren't working, but desperately worried about the families that they normally support. And so we were having regular question and answer sessions for both the staff and work and the furlough staff just to make sure that we were being as open and transparent as we could possibly be with this ever-changing situation. Um, next slide. So what have we learned from the pandemic? So I think I, what I would say is that um, it hasn't all been bad in terms of what we have learned. So we've learned that we can work in a very different way, that we can work remotely, that we can support people in person, even if we're not physically able to go and see them. Um, and Ruth will talk a bit more about some of the initiatives that we've had come out of this. And actually, in some respects, we've been able to engage with more people and certainly some of those harder to reach people. So that's been something that, that has been a learning and something we'll take forward. I think that the other thing that we've learned is for us as an organisation, families and the support that we give them will always be our focus. So there are lots of different things going on during the pandemic, but everything that we did, we came back to us, what, what was it that our families needed from us to support them at this difficult time? And I think um, the other thing that we learned is that actually we had quite separate teams within the organization. So we had our fundraising team, our ops team, our specialist advisors team, our management team, who kind of worked quite individually and um, we had to change almost overnight to make sure that we worked across the charity so that we could adopt um, a smarter way of working and engage as many people as possible. Um, next slide, Ruth. So I'm going to hand you over to Ruth now, who's going to do the second bit of this um, presentation. But as I said, we're happy to take questions if people have got questions either now or at the end. Thank you very much so far, uh, Ruth. And let's see if we can have a discussion maybe afterwards, if we don't have any in the Q&A, Mike, or in the no. chat. So please, Ruth, um, say a little bit about who you are before you start. Yeah. Hello. So I'm Ruth Abazade, and I'm the Head of Service Development at the Huntington's Disease Association. And um, so I've worked for the association for around 12 years now. And and done different roles um, during that time. And it's really nice to see all of your faces actually, because quite often we get people who contact us in England asking for some support from different places in the world. And actually we come on the EHA website and we find out who to direct to. So sometimes we're passing people your way. So it's nice to um, see faces. So, okay, I'll pick up. So, um, Really, one of the first things that we looked at and we've been looking at as we go along was, was supporting our staff because it, it has been really challenging for staff dealing with some really difficult calls, which they always do, but actually they really missed getting in the car and going and seeing the families they support. And it's really different to be sat at your desk trying to offer that support. So we, we offer all of our staff have six weekly supervision all the time and there's always a manager available that they can speak to but we started up weekly team calls using zoom and actually that's really brought the team together and it's it's, it's been a real positive of the situation that we've, we've become a stronger team by doing this um it was really hard for our staff who became furloughed so really um they were told okay tomorrow you're not coming into work and um, thankfully our government were paying um 
a significant part of their wages but actually it's really hard to 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 cut that tie with the families and um, just overnight so um we especially at the start we had regular calls with those staff so that they could still be in touch with each other and they've really sort of been now more independently in touch with each other um in the quite early days we sort of had a staff quiz every wednesday evening just to boost morale and um, get the team mixing so that the ones who were off work and the ones who were in work could mix and more recently um we've started a series of yoga sessions which have just been fantastic for emotional well-being but also just to have a little bit of time away from your desk sometimes when you're sat on calls all, all day uh, now I'm just trying to move my screen forward. Uh, here we go. So in terms of our support for families and professionals, so um, the, the, our website was really important. To, to we, we have a COVID-19 information and advice hub. And what this means that is families can go on there, get the information they need directly, or if they phone through to our advisors, they can look up on here. So we're giving the same advice and that's being kept up to date. So that's been very beneficial. In terms of our advisors, so we, we're very fortunate to have 22 advisors dotted around the country. And this dropped to 10 um, advisors across England and Wales. So this is quite, quite a big difference. We were able to continue telephone and email support. I think that we saw much more a, a increase in people using things like Facebook. And um, that was great because it's a different way of communicating with people. And we also have a system. So pre-COVID, if you lived in London, you would phone the London advisor. Um, but actually we've had to adapt that. And we have this system where anyone who phones or emails um, can speak to someone somewhere in the country. So we did that a little bit before, but it's become um, stronger during COVID. And where we would have provided home visits before, so gone to see families, especially when situations were complex or when they were new to us, that's all moved online. Um, we also have um, a juvenile Huntington's disease advisor, Helen, who you can see here. So, so the real downside was that um, the JHD weekend was cancelled. So this is an annual event for our families where they have a child with JHD. And it's really a highlight of the year for them and a chance to see each other. But what has come out of that is Helen's now organising monthly Zoom calls. And this has been really positive because it means that they're getting to see each other every month rather than once a year. So it's not quite the same as being there in person, but actually it, it's strengthen some of those links and it's also fairly easy to call a speaker into those kind of sessions as well. We have a youth engagement service. So this is James who coordinates our um, service for our children and young adults. He, it, kids kind of stopped engaging with us during COVID. Actually, they were, our schools were closed for many months. The kids were at home, they weren't allowed to go anywhere. And actually for a lot of people, life became a lot easier in those circumstances. A lot of the kids' challenges are around school and social interaction. So he was providing the service, but actually it wasn't used in the same way. And, and what James would have done previously is gone to see those kids in school. He'd meet them with the family first, then he'd use the schools to go and see them. So of course that wasn't an option. Um, he did provide drop-in Zoom calls for children and for parents. Um, th there wasn't a huge uptake for those. The kids just weren't <coughs> particularly interested. But the, the best bit of that was he did a weekly quiz for families. And that was really lovely where people did join in. Um, he also set up um, a HDS Facebook page. So that was just a nice development. And of course, face-to-face -face events had to be cancelled but we're looking now at what we can do for Christmas and we've got some really nice ideas about trying to do something special for, for the kids and now that schools have, have gone back the kids are all back in school and um, they that support has really picked up again so James is rushed off his feet with, with supporting um, children and young people. So in terms of professional support we support by telephone, email, 
We do a lot of joint working with professionals and that's remained the same. And um, training I'll talk about, we were attending lots of multidisciplinary team meetings. So they, they've moved to Zoom, which actually has been great because it's saved us the travel, but you can often have the same input. And attendance at clinics have stopped because they weren't running, some are now. But again, for a lot of our um, families, in some, the link to clinics could be better. So, so a family would call us and then the advisor would call the clinic and we could get some support, albeit over the phone, a lot quicker than we might have been able to do in normal circumstances. So this just gives you a little bit of an idea of the sort of levels of support that we provided. So during, from April to September, almost two and a half thousand individuals, um, eight and a half thousand calls or emails with families and 9,000 with professionals and an idea of sort of video calls text and we do a, a bit of a summary so of those interactions emotional support was provided over 1500 times so that was a key thing that people were looking for and um, we provided crisis support over 300 times and financial advice over 350 times and um, Kath mentioned our branches and support groups so we have over 40 of these run by volunteers across England and Wales our volunteers are um, very important to us and many were able to move those meetings online and what we Bruce, can can i break in with a with a question or mm, of course yeah because i i think maybe kath briefly um uh, touched upon it but uh, based on the information the contact you have with the families how, how are you how is your impression uh, did the the family challenges increase during covid or was it basically more or less the same pre and and, and so i think for those I think, I think particularly in the early days when we had strict lockdown um those challenges increased enormously but i think once um people kind of settled into that routine actually for a lot of people with huntington's they found it much easier because a lot of the kind of choices or challenges of their cognition were taken away because there was very little that they could do and things like certainly we've had feedback from families where they've they've kind of done their clinic appointment over video actually that's taken a tremendous amount of stress out of the clinic appointment so i think we definitely saw in the beginning a massive you know increase of of concern from families but i think over time that has has settled um, although I, I think kind of the lack of community resources during lockdown and that's quite slow coming back has been a challenge. How fast did that adaption go? Four weeks, six weeks, ten weeks? Yeah, I think within probably about four weeks, those those people who were kind of those, those more challenging people had kind of got into that slower routine. And so actually, um, I think that they were easier to manage from a carer's perspective but then of course on the other side of that the carers weren't having carers coming in necessarily and they weren't getting that kind of support so actually being with somebody 24 hours a day suddenly um was was challenging so i think i would say initially in that kind of two first two to three months we saw um a very significant challenge for families but it seemed to kind of peter down into something that was kind of easier for for people to manage and we you know we were able to adapt what we were doing as well very interesting i think Thank we've you. seen certain peaks as well with with um, what's coming from the government so as kath said when those first letters came out sort of advising people that that was a peak time but also a big thing was when um so now we have to wear face masks in shops on public transport etc and the face masks was quite an issue again for people so people who just couldn't manage those and and actually you can have an exemption you don't have to wear one but it feels like a, as a new piece of news comes out we sort of have to prepare for for, for what that will mean to the families really um, and and another thing just to mention is um a, one big thing is our, our carers have found it really really hard when they have a loved one in a care home so mm -hmm. essentially 
you can't visit your loved one in a care home um, in most circumstances. So people have now gone months and months and months without being able to see this person who actually, although many pe people might live in a, in a care home, often the family might have still quite a lot of input, even to the level of going every day to feed them their lunch and things like that. So that's been a challenge for, for everyone in the country who has a, a loved one in a care home, but certainly something we've seen. Um, and it, it's, it's actually something that's quite big in our news stories at the moment of what's going to happen about this. And um, so there's been a period where you can go and see people and sit in the garden or see someone through a window, but actually that can be quite challenging for people as well, because maybe they don't quite understand um, that setup. So, um, so yeah, with, with our peer support, um, everything used to sort of happen um, quite individually. So, so the brand, the, or our volunteers would maybe run a support group um, somewhere in the country, but they wouldn't really speak to any of the other volunteers who were doing the same thing. So there wasn't that support for, for our leaders and volunteers. Um, and we're now doing monthly calls for those group leaders and that's been really positive and just a real nice opportunity for people to support each other and to ask us questions. Um, we've also started <laughs> online carers groups. So we've had 15, which we've, 15 groups so far with over 70 attendees. So um, many people who we thought might struggle getting online have, have managed to, and um, which has been really positive. Um, our message board, um, so, so we have a message board which is really a peer support option and that's continued to be um, useful during COVID and I think certainly um, we can see some peaks where people have used that maybe more than they would have pre-COVID. Um, so HD Voice is our patient and public involvement group, so it's just a small group, it's, it's 30 people but we input into lots of things. And the real, it, because of COVID, we're now online. So it felt like before it was just individuals, whereas now it, it's a group. So again, just a, a positive that's come out. Um, yeah, we've now had 15 webinars and over 320 attendees. So definitely reaching people we wouldn't have reached before um, in terms of professionals. So the, um, this afternoon I was hosting a webinar, so doing your job, Mike, and, and so <laughs> the shoe's on the other foot now <laughs> this evening. Um, so I, I would say, I, I just it, adding to the reflection and learning, I just think Huntington's disease it is classed as a rare disease in, in, um, in our terms here, so, so not as rare as some others, but it's a real opportunity because actually to get people together in face-to-face, in-person situations is, is really hard. So people live a long way apart. They have carer responsibilities. It's, it's pretty tough. And actually just being able to come online, we know it's not right for everyone, but it, it's been an amazing opportunity to force our hands on that. And we're very glad to have done that. Um, really sort of strengthening the team um, in terms of the way we work and actually talking to each other more. Um, I think we always felt we didn't have time for that because we were busy seeing families, but actually it, it's very beneficial um, and that links in with communications. Um, so I think we've learned a lot of lessons and we've learned a lot of things that we needed to improve on. So we will certainly Zoom will continue to be our friend. Um, I can't imagine ever traveling in the way that we did before. Um, and great to have an opportunity like this as well and going even wider. Um, and I think things like our monitoring and evaluation, we realized, oh, well, they actually relied on our family visits. So we really need to change that. So giving families different ways to input into our services. So it's been a challenge, but there's been some positives that have come out of it, and we hope to make the most of, of those moving forwards. Thank you. Really interesting, and and it's good that that these the, this crisis also brings some good experiences that that we will benefit from also uh, post COVID. Uh, and sure, we are all being better in using these digital platforms. Uh, so that's really good. Thank you so much, both of you. Anyone who have uh, comments uh, you want to uh, bring up at this point in time? Otherwise, I think it could be good with, uh, I think maybe a five minute break is okay. 
just to stretch your arms and maybe pick something to drink or some yeah. something i think maybe philippa do you have a comment ah. no i was just saying i was going to say that even for for really small associations like the huntington portuguese association uh, this this had really some positive uh, points and and for us it was the same we is all of a sudden we were able to reach families in in parts of portugal that we 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 didn't reach before so um even as i said in a such small country like like mine so 600 kilometers the families from the north don't go to 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 the south part of the country so it's it was always a big deal to get everyone together and with the zoom platforms and all these virtual meetings uh, all of a sudden it, it it began it started to be possible and that's a really good thing for us at least mm. good Okay, so I'll give you a five minute break and be back at uh, 1949 Central European time. Okay. <laughs> okay. See you soon. Just waiting for Karina and Annette, who comes from a, a very different association, I would uh, say, with a yes. special history and a, and a different structure. That's true. But that's really also pur on purpose because we wanted two different associations to share how they are working and um, and manage to operate in these times so um, i can't remember karina was it you starting or anetta um i could put up our um, presentation uh, um. and then also say a little bit about who you are yes so oops so, um, yes, but you can start, Annette. I'm going to talk a lot. He, uh, Karina will have the head part of the talk here. But um, I'm Annette Karlsson. I'm uh, newly started as the chairman uh, of the, our board. And re before that, I was uh, secretary in, in the board for many years. And I don't come from a Huntington family. I um, have been um, in a special team uh, as uh, I'm a dental hygienist for a long time and uh, I've been a part of diff different uh, projects and uh, I find it very, very important to uh, help persons with Huntington's disease in the way I can. Uh, in my profession and also as a volunteer in the board in support groups and so on. Okay. Mm. Um, I'm Karina Ballstedt. Um, I have um, uh, been working with HD since 2006. Uh, and before that, I was working um, in a special center for rare diseases for 10 years before that. So I have met a lot of family with uh, rare diseases. Um, I'm working as a project manager for, um, for the lay association and uh, I'm also, um, uh, I am a psychiatrist nurse for my profession and I'm not a family member, um, but as Filippa, as you said, and now we have a lot of contact with families for a number of years, so it's like the, the, that I belong to the HD family as well. So we are going to give you a presentation about our lay association and also the impact of uh, this pandemic um, disaster uh, those months. So we are, we are working with um, support for individuals, for families and loved ones affected by Huntington's disease. Uh, and we try to collect, develop and spread knowledge about the disease. And we also create forums to support sufferers and their families. And we are doing that with uh, different projects. Uh, we, every year we have a national meeting uh, for our families. Uh, and this year we, we had a digital one. And 
what's was good outcoming from that was that we reach a lot of more people as Ruth and Kat all, already has told us. So that has been very positive. Instead of having 100 people, now we have uh, more than 200 that was attended uh, the meeting. Karina, can I say something about the national meetings? Yes. Uh, the national meetings are, is not only for the families, we also have the professionals attending the national meetings and that is very important and the carers also take part of the national meetings. Yeah, and on the meeting we also have a, um, um, always have a report from what, what kind of research project that is going on. Um, we are also working with education and supervision. Uh, that has, has also been in this time, of course, with Zoom. Uh, it has been possible to reach out in the country uh, on uh, uh, town, cities that we weren't before. So that has also been positive uh, in this time. Um, we are running family camp. Uh, this year we have to postpone the one that we was planning to have in, in, in summer. Uh, we also have youth, young adults camp and conferences, and now we also had to postpone that one because uh, of the risk to meet each other. Uh, and we also have support groups. And um, now, Annette, you can talk about what you're doing with your support group. Yes, we have tried in our local support group here. I live in Gothenburg in Sweden, and here we have had some Zoom meetings also for our families and the persons so we can see each other and talk to each other. But it's just for start, we have had two meetings and we will have another now this Saturday. And the, uh, this time we will have more and attendees. Uh, we knew that already, and that is very interesting. And we try to, uh, in, in the meetings, we try to tell them if there is any news. We look into our website and so on and try to uh, tell them uh, about news uh, about Huntington's disease and share our, uh, what, what we, our experiences. And we also have the international cooperation with EHDN and with EHA. Uh, we have been working together for a, for a number of years. And uh, we also uh, try to, to, to reach out to the members to see all these webinars that's going on so they could attend on this. Uh, we was founded 2011 uh, and we collaborate with the Huntington team in Sweden. Uh, and we have um, five Huntington team uh, in Sweden, and we have approximately 600 members in uh, the association, and that's mostly family and relatives and uh, also some professionals. Uh, we have a coordinator, and she's working four days a week. Uh, so she selects to have calls from all over the countries, uh, from social workers when they have some problems, uh, for instance. Uh, she's also coordinate when we have conferences, camps, training and lectures. Um, also with other countries, organizations uh, and board works. And she's also the cashier. Heter det Kassa? Cashier. Yes, yeah. I think so. Yeah, treasure. Yeah. treasure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and she also doing some board works that um, when we have a family that needs some support, then she will be the link into the team sometimes or to one of us uh, working in the board. And in the board, we are 10 people uh, and there are family members, gene carriers and, and professionals. And I think we are half, half. Uh, in, in the board. Uh, we have training requests and uh, we guidance um, to assist companies and uh, we also have the contact with the different teams uh, for special uh, knowledge. Uh, 
we have uh, sorry uh, could you go back to the map uh, Karina yes because maybe I don't quite understand in in these cities you have mentioned here on the map do yeah. you have teams there with with care uh, professionals or, or clinicians in the hospital or no. we have teams in Skåne that's in Lund that's the most south and then we have in Gothenburg uh, wait a minute my mouse there Gothenburg we have in Stockholm Uppsala and Umeå, you don't see it, but it's it's here. Uh, and these others are support groups that we have in Sweden. I see. But the teams are really hired by the public healthcare system, yeah, but you yeah. collaborate with them, if I understand. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We are working on it a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's it, not always so simple no. uh, to get the um, collaboration. No. There may be different Very levels different. of interest to interact with you. Is that what you're saying, maybe? What did you say? That they are not all so interested in, in communicating and no. collaborating with you. Is that? No, they don't uh, uh, understand the value yet. <laughs> we work on it. <laughs> it's an ongoing work, if you say so. And, and I think in, in Sweden, the lay association don't have that big power. Uh, it's different associations, but um, I don't, I think it's coming more and more, but um, it's um, not always that good. And I, I think sometimes it's, it's quite difficult because we are a lot of professionals and, and we have been working for a number of years now with HD. So we, we have more knowledge than them sometimes, I think. That could be a problem sometimes. Uh, we have been uh, succeeded in having different projects. Uh, so we have been working with um, uh, how to take care of people with HD, to educate families, uh, people with HD and professionals. And uh, now we are working on uh, uh, practical nursing guidance in Huntington's disease, and that's uh, digital. Uh, so it's for free, and then could people access uh, to this education? So it's looked like this. It's a web education. And um, then you have the knowledge. It's about one hour and 20 minutes. And then you have a, an introduction. What is HD? Uh, and after that, when you are in, in, in the staff, for instance, have this ed education, uh, then you process the education at two times with, um, with your boss. And then after that, you can have a diploma that you have done this education. And now we are working on uh, to have deeper um, knowledge about communication difficulties, uh, psychiatric symptoms, cognitive in, in impairments, um, occupational therapy, at the dining table with dysphagia, Heimlich maneuver, uh, all those things, uh, medical treatment, um, care home uh, and care in the life final stage like palliative care. So these are, we call it boxes. So then we are working with um, those education uh, so it's all on web web training and then you have a menu like this about the disease symptoms heritage uh, occupational therapy eating relatives and things like that so then you go through all those things and here is for instance then you can have some small movies That's one of our doctors that she ex explained what Huntington's disease is. Uh, and then you also can have, then you have some PowerPoint in between. And then you have a, a person who is reading the text. So you can read and you can hear it at the same time. So you have the knowledge about it. And here you have uh, small movies and on these small movies, you can you can see the movement. Uh, for instance, here you can see. Oh. 
Sorry. So that you can see that it's a difference. I mean, sometimes you have people, they say they know HD because they have met a person once, but it, it, it had a lot of faces. Um, so there you can also have this education. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Karina, did you say how you were able to finance making these videos? But that's really uh, something that yeah. runs in, through your information material, that you use a lot of videos, which is really a nice way to yeah. present. We have, uh, in, in Sweden, uh, when a person dies and don't have any relatives, uh, the money goes to the government. And, and the, the government uh, put it in different funding and uh, paper and houses and things like that. And then you have the, the scenes from this income. Uh, they are coming into to this foundation. And then you can apply for money when you are working with children or adults with disabilities. And we have succeeded. So I have actually been working since 2006 with these fundings in, in different, some now I'm full full time, but other times perhaps twice a week or just depending on what kind of project that we have been running. We have a project for how it is for a child to grow up in a family with a neurological disease. Uh, and we also have this with education. So we are working a lot with education. So on our web page, we have a lot of education um, that we can go into. And um, uh, so I was thinking of that we could give you a short view. Um, perhaps I need to, to take that down. Um, are, you, are you seeing no. my, the web page? No, you, you have to stop the sharing, Karina. Uh -huh. uh, okay. Change the, the page you want to show. You have to stop sharing and then yeah. share. And share again. Yes. So does it work now? Yes. Yeah. So here we have a lot of education, but here we have the news. Uh, here it's about uh, the support group that we have a Zoom meeting on Saturday. Uh, we are also going to have a digital uh, education day about Huntington's disease. And then you can join that one. Uh, and then here we have a European Huntington's Association that they could read more about the webinars. Um, here we also have an article in, in, in the paper. Here's the news from EHA. Uh, and here you can see the national meeting also now uh, because it's recorded. Um, we have done a movie for um, uh, heart stop and also Luftweg stop, uh, Heimlich. Oh. Really emergency. Uh, yeah, emergency, yes. Uh, but with what we have done in, in COVID, I have done some uh, interviews with people, um, with our coordinator, with uh, Annette as, as uh, the new president. Uh, we have some um, um, research from our uh, doctor Osa Petersen, she's the one in Sweden that are doing a lot of research and also how it is to be a relative during and how it is to work uh, with a de as a dental hygienist in, um, in these times. And here also a person who have a personal assistant, how, how they are doing during this uh, COVID time. So, and here we have information about uh, coronavirus and so on, information and, and uh, the conference in, Sp in Palm Spring and things like that. So you can say that our face is our web page. Uh, and then we also try to connect that with a Facebook page. Uh, so we, we um, in this COVID time, it has been, different in Sweden because we, we don't have lockdown as you all know uh, and uh, so the situation has 
it's not to compare with with uh, the situation that you have in other countries. Uh, some of the teams they have been been seeing the patient, some are not, but they have done telephone conferences and so on. Um, but at the care home is the same as in England that you you can't um, now you can again, but before you you couldn't. Uh, go to visit your relatives um, but now I think they perhaps they will stop it again because it's it's higher now with the number of people with uh, with COVID uh, so um, we have a quite another situation you can say uh, is the is the web page uh, is uh, is a lot of people using the web page you feel you have any yeah we have a lot of visitors uh, we we have uh, every year we have the national meeting and we are taping we are doing a lot of movies uh, and we can go into our account and then we could see that we have a, a lot of people that uh, has been looking into different uh, movies. Karina, so, can I ask something? Yeah. Were, were the neurological visits uh, and the, the clinical care also interrupted or not? Doing no, at some some clinic, they stopped the physical meeting. But some uh, in Lund, for instance, uh, they have they have been seeing uh, the patient um, yeah, for, further on. But not in our region, not in Gothenburg. They haven't seen no. them. No. They had a, a telephone contact, and of course, emergency other contacts also. But. No. And, but, and they are starting to see some of them now. But uh, about the question about the website, so that is also something we are working on all the time to get people to go into the to the website and and look what's news and what they can what we offer there. Uh, I, for instance, as I work also as a dental hygienist, meeting a lot of patients with Huntington's disease, and they come to the clinic with their assistants. And I always bring that question up. If they, have you been uh, at our website? <laughs> have you been looking at it? And many, many times they say, they, do, they don't have the time while they're working. So if they're going to look into the website, they have to do it in their spare time. And not everyone does that. But I think it's a continuously work, work we have to have. Yeah. Uh, and we also try now to, to see if we could translate some of um, the research uh, that we had of the, on the national meeting to English. So we have uh, we are now having a meeting tomorrow to see if, if some from the pharma industry could uh, translate the, those movies that we have done. Uh, so I think it's good to, to share things between countries as well when we have things that we really think that could reach out to more people. So, yes, I fully agree. And I think, yeah, I mean, you are making a lot of really valuable content. And I know that we have been in touch with, with the HDA and, and Wales several times to ask if we can share content you have made. And you are always very generous and say, yes, please share. So, so, so it's really, we can, we can um, use each other's uh, content, I think, uh, more even because it's, it's, it's really good information in it. Yeah, and I, I think that we could learn a lot. I mean, uh, we have uh, sometimes uh, difficulties uh, to reach out to the families and also into the team. And I think that you have succeeded with that in England and Scotland and in other countries much more than we have. So I think that we could learn a lot um, how to do it <laughs> because uh, sometimes... Um, I think that we it, it should be easier to work together with professionals. Um, I think but... um, it's so. I think I wouldn't say it's always easy, even in in England and Wales. So I think where you have professionals who have got a genuine interest in Huntington's, then you probably found it easier. But where you've got people who perhaps are seeing Huntington's as 
as a part of a much bigger kind of caseload, then that can be more of a challenge. But um, I think you have the right attitude. I think it's about persistence and also about kind of being able to demonstrate that you have something to offer them, which clearly you do. You've got some amazing resources there. So yeah, just be a bull, a British bulldog was what I, I would say. Yeah, and, and sometimes for us it's difficult because some of those team, they are working perhaps one day a week with HD, not even that. So then they don't have that interest in, in the disease in that way. No, but that's just the real world we are living in. And yeah, I know. Like trying to, to do your best and, yeah. and also focus on those who are really interested in who generates you know, yeah, yeah, of course. Energy and positivity. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I would say best you can do. Our, a lot of our work is with an individual professional. So, actually, when they're in that moment working with someone with Huntington's and they don't know really where to go, then some of them will really, really value our support because actually we can have one phone call and inform them of different places to be referred to. We can send them some literature. And then we can go on to work together and be involved at the meetings. But it does feel that our in, we, we link in with the clinic, the, the HD clinics well. Um, but then, yes, sort of social workers or a mental health team, it's, it's often on a case by case basis. And then occasionally we get, um, for example, a social worker who has a special interest and then they're allowed to take on the next person with Huntington's and the next person. So they start to, to build a specialism, but yeah, it's certainly a, a, a challenge at times. Yeah, I think that's also, it's, um, I mean, we are just yes, since uh, 10, year, 10 years, we have the lay association now next year. Um, perhaps we need more, more time uh, to, um, but, but it's difficult that um, people are not, they think they could do by themselves. <laughs> Sometimes, yes. so um, that's, um, yeah, that's strange. But we have to, to work on and uh, also to have more people to be involved in, in the association and, and to work as, as volunteers. And we also have a quite tricky and, and, and problem to, to support our youth and, and young people. So uh, I have also been speaking to to HGU to see if we can collaborate and, and, and find a way together because um, we are working in the border. We are quite a few that are working very much and, and then we can't do everything. We need to, to share and uh, so to find some other ways of how, how to support the young because I think that we are leaving them and team are also leaving them. Um, not giving them the support that they need. I guess this touches also upon a, a really common challenge for all of us in, in mm. the associations. It's how to recruit new people to get involved one way or another mm. um, as volunteers or, or doing something for the, uh, for the associations and, and to recruit also from younger generations. Mm having the same faces <laughs> throughout yeah. decenniums, yes. Do you have any advice, any of you, on, on how you can have people engaged and motivated to take part? Any good experience? So I think kind of finding out what's important to those people rather than assuming that we know what's important. So I think um, one of the things that I learned kind of quite early on when I was working with people with Huntington's, so before I was in this role, I worked as a specialist advisor and I set up a, a group for young people, a pre or under 18s. This was before we had a youth worker. It, it was kind of before we had um, that kind of youth support, dedicated support that we have now. And, and I guess I made some assumptions about things that would, that were quite, I thought would be quite important to those young people. But actually when we sat down with them and discussed the things that were important to them, they were very different things. So 
you know, to me, I thought things like their genetic risk would be something that was crucially important. And actually, they were dealing with quite a lot of them were dealing with um, living at home with mom or dad with Huntington's as the sole parent. And actually, that was their focus of, of what was important in supporting them. So I think really finding out what the key things that are important and, and not assuming that we know would be my advice. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. Um, there's always a sense that kids will always use social media and that's the way to, to get to them and that, that's what to do. And we actually haven't really found that. So um, I think one reason is if we're looking at Facebook, they've already moved on to social media <laughs> platforms ahead of us. We're always behind. But um, also it, it just... I think when we were recruiting our, our um, youth worker, we had that in mind. And, and actually what they really wanted was the face-to-face -face sessions with, with the youth workers. They wanted them to come to their school, to, to talk to them. Um, but of course that's very, very re resource heavy. So for one person to travel around the country and sit with people for an hour. So um, I, I'm hoping that you know now actually it, it's been forced that they have to speak to James on the phone or by video and hopefully get moving forward, that this will be easier. Um, our youth conference was a really good success. So for 18 to 35 year olds, we um, have a weekend that runs every year. And we did that at fairly low cost to them. Um, and we do it in quite a nice hotel, like there's a spa facility, there's a swimming pool. And we say to people, you don't have to come to everything, you know, come and do the bits that you want to. And most people do come to, to all of it but they share personal experiences um, and then they're more likely to engage because they'll make bonds moving forward so that they've got those people along their side as, as they go forwards. Um, and some of our resources like our, our young adults booklet and things, um, I'm always happy to, you know, if, if anyone wants those things, we can send out or have, have a conversation or um, Karina, James, our youth worker would be very happy to sort of, um, share any of his thoughts as well um but it is interesting things like we'll say oh let's take young kids to a climbing wall they'll really love that and actually no one signs up for it or very low numbers so it's it's testing things out um and at christmas as i said we'd like to do something just a bit special where maybe they can all join in on netflix we can all watch a movie together and maybe we can post out some snacks and treats to try and make it a bit special for them um, but what we're going to do is, is do a poll. So just actually try and get their engagement of would you like to do this? Would you like to have a magician show? Would you like to do something and see if we can get their input before we start planning too much? So that's sort of, um, we're also with HD Voice, we have our panel and it's, it's, it's um, adults, but we are looking to have a young people's panel, which links in and that we involve and we're just writing a teenager's guide at the moment. So we we got young people involved in writing that. So where you've got people who are, who are willing to give their time, that is the best way of learning is picking their brains to find out what appeals to them. Mm. And I, I'd kind of echo that in terms of, so our, our current chair, who, who is a kind of young man from a Huntington's family, actually um, he, the, the, I'd say family history of Huntington's he and his sister had never talked to anybody else about kind of growing up in a family with Huntington's or even about Huntington's came to one of our youth conferences and was just kind of blown away by the fact that that there were other young people in the same situation and you know he's kind of grown from that to to get really involved in our board of trustees is now our chair you know he's a really good advocate for us so I think if you're putting something on that meets people's needs then that automatically then brings them into the organization because they want to give something back if that makes sense mm. yeah yeah so i mean we have had a lot of conferences and also together with, with norway and, and we try to have a collaboration but it's difficult to have um, that they want to work further um, by themselves um that's uh, that's the point um 
So, but still, I think, yeah, I, I, I realize that, uh, Karina. Uh, but I see also from, from the Norwegian group and, and where they have now joined Swedish camps or we have had some together. Um, so these, these young people between, I would say, maybe 20 and 30 years, more or less, there are a few uh, who are now more engaged. So I think, yeah, I think it really can be a way mm. at least into getting to know the association and as Kath say, maybe yeah. wanting to give something back or finding a way to give something back because yeah. uh, we have been discussing are young people different in the way they engage than, than we are? I mean, from, from our generation uh, or I, I have to speak for myself. <laughs> we have different ages here, but uh, <laughs> but maybe, I don't know. Mike, and maybe you can answer. I, I can speak for the young people here. Yes, please. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> uh, no, I don't know if it's that different, actually. I think the the basic needs are often the same, I think. Yeah. Uh, but as, as but, in our country, we are not so many. There are not so many young persons and they are spread over the country. So there it's it's not so very natural natural that they that they meet, that they can see each other. And I think that's important also that they can connect and meet and see each other face more than face to face, body to body, or so that you you get the uh, chance to really uh, knew each other. And that's uh, I think that is a problem for for us in Sweden. Uh, they are uh, they have, they are long distance between, and they need a lot of support. Mm. Uh, we have a, a question from from Saya here from Finland, right? Uh, she has a dog barking, so she wrote it in the chat. But um, she says that she really liked the videos by the Swedish association. Um, and she's wondering if it was difficult to find volunteers. Uh, talk on I the videos, I guess you're meaning, Saya. Is that what you the video. Yeah. 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 No, actually not, because this has been families that we have um, had for a number of years in our, our family camps and so on. And so we have a number of people that want to share um, their experience. Uh, so in, in that matter, we have succeeded in, when we have uh, our camps, we have had the film team that have, have done those uh, uh, movies so that we, we could could have it. So that has been uh, uh, really good. The young people are the most, that's difficult because it, it, it's quite tricky to, to be on a movie that you can see on a web page and, and um, they are more restricted, uh, some of them. But when they are, are talking of, about their parents with the disease, it's much easier actually. And, and, in compared to, to talk about your own, your own situation. But we have a lot of movies and, and also in this uh, web education and we are also trying to see if we could translate it to English so we could, could be available for you. And, and um, Astrid and I are speaking about that and, and to see on what level could we do it for uh, international purposes and um, to make an um, I mean, some things are for when you're living in Sweden, uh, but I think the most of the education uh, could be used for other people as well. Yeah, and I guess also it makes really sense to think about maybe, I mean, Finland and, and, and uh, Sweden and Norway and, and Denmark. I mean, we share a lot culturally and historically, and, and I guess mm. be of high relevance to, to, to have each other's uh, stories really shared. Yeah. Uh, and Saila, do you speak Swedish? Do you understand Swedish? Sorry. Late, uh, just a little bit. Just a uh, school, school Swedish. Yeah, but I mean, Late I could day. send you a link to the education and then you can look in, into it. If, if you write yeah, your... Sure. Uh, that will you can write your email address in, in the chat room and then I could collect the comment, it. Yeah. So then I could send it okay. to you. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks. Yeah. And Karina, I was interested, are you 
charging people to use the e-learning? Will there be a cost for people yeah. when they sign up? Yeah, we have, um, we, we ed educate um, care home, for instance, and then I educate one who are responsible for education and one from the staff. Uh, so they are running this education for, for each one uh, and the person are, are sitting um, alone and, and, and are doing this web education and they could do it on their smartphones. Uh, you can have it in all media. Uh, and then after that, uh, then you, 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 you're putting the group together and then you are going, then you have a PowerPoint with the same as the education. And but do you charge looking. them? So do they have to pay anything? To no. Take no. that. It's for free charge. during this project time. It's free. Yeah. So we don't need to, after the project we need, because you have to have some techno technology and things like that. So, so, but it will be quite um, not that expensive. So. Mm -hmm. Alina, can I ask, because it wasn't clear to me, the, the, those educational courses are, are for, for um, informal carers, so family members, or for only for professionals? Or... It's, for, it's for both. I think it's also for family members and uh, for pro professionals, uh, more for like care homes and people who are working close to the people with the disease. Okay, okay. But it could also be for social worker and I mean people who want to know more about the disease. Okay, but it's written in a way that family members understand and, and can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, the language is quite easy in, okay. in the education, so it's not uh, okay. difficult. We are trying to make it as easy as possible. So they already have a family diploma and then they get a professional diploma. When yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay, so. we have uh, we have reached actually the hour of uh, nine thirty here. Does anybody have a final comment or question or something you want to pose? Just uh, one thing to think about is when we're all talking about the issue of struggling with working with young people, is it something that maybe we could have a further discussion on and? You know, maybe if we were doing something like our young adults conference, which will now go online, maybe we could do something, think about something internationally to, to do or just um, see if we could maybe collaborate um, and see if that could work going forward. Yes, yeah, sure. That's a very good idea, Ruth, because that could very well be seen as interesting in a way for, for young people because they are really connecting uh, across borders. So that could be something we should explore. Very good idea. Astrid, can I comment? Yes. Uh, uh, this year we've uh, done, done some uh, separate um, support groups for young people, the spouses, the, the, the patients, and, and also the gene negative and uh, people at risk. Since there's only like 100 members, the, the, <laughs> the uh, the group members are not that big, but we're trying because I think it's really important that uh, all of us get the, the specific uh, support from their peers and not just uh, from the Huntington uh, uh, families in general. So mm -hmm. we'll see how it goes. Yeah, but you do that online then, of course. That's what you're saying, huh? It's an online... Yeah, it's a Facebook, Facebook groups. Yeah, mm, exactly. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. We were not so many, but it was a really a good group and a very good um, discussion. And thank you so much for all the valuable input. It's really encouraging to hear and and uh, and learn and and get some ideas and and just be stimulated in what we are all doing. So, so we work from where we are and and do what whatever we can. So uh, yeah, let's follow up uh, and see if we can do something together and uh, and move us forward, all of us. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. And next week will be uh, Philippa and uh, young Erin from my family, actually, or my and Marie's family, talking yeah. about cognitive changes and.
challenges in Huntington's disease. So that will also be yeah. very- Can you send the link for it? Uh, I can send you the link. Yes, we can, Nira. And it will also be recorded? Yes. Yes. Oh, perfect. <laughs> time I remember. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you yeah. so much. And we have to wave <laughs> since we yeah. got a hug. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye. 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 <laughs> so then I can. Det var ju väldigt fint. Mm.